Today we're taking a glimpse at an underdog of an instruction set, but this underdog might reshape the landscape of the computing industry. This is no ordinary RISC-V board. The Kendrite K230 is the first widely available consumer RISC-V processor with the ratified 1.0 vector extensions. Let's get wired in. The next instruction, VAD, is going to... Whoa, 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 hold on. Before we get into the raw assembly instructions, let's talk a little bit about what RISC-V is, what the heck vector instructions are, and why the 1.0 spec is so important. RISC-V is an open standard instruction set architecture, or ISA. ISAs are like blueprints for a CPU, defining how instructions are used and executed. Over the years, many proprietary ISAs have been created, like x86 or ARM. These ISAs are not only costly to license, but it's almost impossible to get new instructions added to the spec without very powerful connections. What makes RISC-V special is that the standard is completely open and free for anyone to use. Researchers, developers, and scientists can build and modify their own RISC-V CPUs without any licensing fees. It's also extremely modular. The base RISC-V ISA is quite simple, but allows for optional extensions. Silicon makers customize a RISC-V CPU with just the features they need, increasing efficiency. RISC-V is used everywhere from tiny IoT devices to full machine learning accelerators like Google with their tensor processing units. One of the key extensions that highlights RISC-V's flexibility is its support for vector instructions. But what are vector instructions and why should we care? Imagine you're in a bakery. You need to bake some cookies and you have two options. You can either bake them one at a time, also known as scalar processing, or you can use a big tray to bake dozens of cookies at once, vector processing. Which do you think is more efficient? The large tray, right? This is essentially what vector instructions do at a basic level. They allow the CPU to perform the same operation on multiple pieces of data at the same time in a single instruction. This type of computing is incredibly useful for things like image processing, scientific simulations, machine learning, and more. Let's jump back into the computer and see a real life example. The Mandelbrot is a complex fractal that requires intensive calculations to visualize. I've written some code to compare two approaches, a traditional method and a vectorized method. In the non-vectorized implementation, each point in the fractal is computed individually, which is inefficient. However, we can use vector instructions to process multiple points simultaneously. Each one of these fractals went through 1,000 iterations, and as you can see, the vectorized version was computed significantly faster, in this case, three times faster. On this x86 CPU, NumPy takes advantage of assembly instructions like vmolps and vaddps to perform parallel multiplications and additions. The RISC-V spec has similar speedups with a few additional tricks up its sleeve. The RISC-V vector extension is a bit special, using something called vector length agnosticism, or VLA. Sounds pretty complicated, but let me explain. Going back to our baking analogy, vector length agnosticism is like having a magical baking tray that can dynamically adjust its size to fit different ovens. Traditional CPUs like x86 use fixed length vector registers, which is like having fixed size baking trays. We started with small ones like MMX 64-bit in 1997, then added bigger ones over time. Eventually, x86 got things like SSE 128-bit in 1999, AVX 256-bit in 2008, and AVX 512 512-bits in 2013. But there's a problem. Each time a new tray size was introduced, the bakery had to keep using all the old trays too for backwards compatibility, which makes things much more complicated. The RISC-V vector instructions are different. Instead of using a fixed tray size, it has a tray that can magically adjust to any size. This means we can use any oven, big or small, without needing to keep multiple tray sizes around. 
So why does this vector length agnosticism matter? It means that the same RISC-V vector code can run on different size CPUs without modifications. Whether it's a single board computer like this guy, or a full supercomputer, the compiled binary can remain the same. That means that as hardware evolves, VLA ensures that existing code can take advantage of new advancements in vector processing without recompilation. It's effectively future-proof. Not to say that RISC-V hasn't had its fair share of challenges, particularly when it comes to the vector implementation. You might be asking yourself, Lori, what is so special about this particular board? After all, SBCs like the MILK-5 Duo, Beagle-5, and Star-5's Vision-5 2 have been out for a while. This little guy, the K230, is one of the few boards as of today with the ratified 1.0 vector extension specification. All those other boards I mentioned earlier either don't have vector extensions at all or use the 0.7 draft spec. Here's what's tricky about the earlier 0.7 draft spec. It's a preliminary set of vector instructions, more of a proposal to get feedback from developers and guide the development of the final spec. The 0.7 spec isn't really designed for your everyday computing projects. It was a way to beta test what was yet to come. The 1.0 spec is a fully ratified standard with detailed documentation and code examples, and will serve as the baseline going forward for future backwards compatibility. Toolchains, compilers, and packages can start to target the 1.0 spec now without fear of becoming obsolete anytime soon. Unfortunately, most programs compiled for the 0.7 draft spec probably won't execute correctly on 1.0 hardware due to some changes in instruction formats and encodings. Many edge cases have been smoothed out, especially for instructions like vSlideUp and others, ensuring more consistent behavior across data types. In any case, now that the 1.0 spec is here, there's no good reason to continue tinkering around with obsolete hardware. Enough chit chat. I think it's time for some assembly. To very briefly explain what we're working with here, this is a CAN MV K230 version 1.1 single board computer, which contains Kendrite K230 system on a chip. If we take a closer look at this sock, you'll notice that the CPU cores are actually C908 cores manufactured by Sean Tai. One has the vector extensions and is a bit faster, and the other core is smaller, slower, and doesn't have any vector speedups. Today, for simplicity, I'm just running Debian on the 5.10.4 kernel with just the larger 1.6 GHz core with the vector instructions. Here I am connected to the board right now, and I already have an application that I pre-compiled to take advantage and demonstrate using the vector instructions to add two vectors together. Here's our binary, so if we want to verify the instruction set architecture, we can use the file command. Let's just do file, vector, and indeed we have a 64-bit ELF binary that is running the RISC-V instruction set architecture. Let's take a look at the code and walk through some of the vector-specific instructions that we want to take note of. Here I have the source code for that vector application that I mentioned earlier, and let's walk through what are the instructions that are specifically dealing with vectors right here. This VSET VLI is going to be a really important instruction, but let's move on to some of the others and come back to this. First of all, we have two vectors that we're defining down here. Each of them has eight values inside of it. Each of these are going to be one word, which is going to be 32 bits wide. And then we're allocating some space where we're going to be storing the result or the addition of these two vectors. First of all, we have some load address commands that are just our standard RISC-V instructions that are loading the address of this data into the A2 and A3 register. The next instruction is going to be very important. This stands for vector load elements, and what this is doing is this is loading the elements pointed to here inside of our actual vector register V0. So we have specific registers that are designated for our vector operations. And interestingly enough, this size is going to change depending on the size of the elements in which we're loading. For example, since we have the word values that we're using inside of our vectors, these are going to be 32 bits wide, hence we have 
have the vector load elements, 32. The next instruction, vAdd, is going to be the meat of our vector instruction addition. So this obviously is performing addition between two different vectors. Dot .vv stands for vector vector that we're going to be specifying as two operands for this. Now, since we previously loaded the vectors into our v0 and v8 vector registers, we can use this instruction to sum these two vectors and then store the result inside of our v0 vector register. But now, all of the result is inside of a vector-specific register, so if we want to use this and store this back into our memory location inside of the space that we've allocated for this result, we're going to have to use another special vector instruction. And this is going to be vector store element 32. Again, the 32 depends on the size of the elements within the vector that you're trying to store. We can take this v0, which contains the result vector from our addition, and store this inside of a4, which has the pointer to this location in memory, and we have successfully performed our addition. Now let's move on to our last important vector instruction. This v set vli is going to be really important and set up the type and length for the vector that we're about to be dealing with. One important thing to note is that you can request a larger length for the vector than what is actually available inside of the hardware. Now let's move on and let's go debug our code so we can watch this vector addition happening in real time. I'm going to go to my SSH connection for my board and we have our previously compiled binary that we're going to run. And let's use GDB so that we can demonstrate the vector instructions in addition happening in real time. I'm going to do gdb dot slash vector and let's start our application. Let's do a breakpoint on the initial starting point of this application. Now we have a first breakpoint set, but let's also set one towards the end so that we can see our values before and after we've performed the actual vector addition. So I'm going to do disassemble start and let's do another breakpoint maybe towards the end of this application before the exit system call. Let's do b start plus let's say 52. Now we have two breakpoints set. I'm going to run my application and we have successfully hit the initial breakpoint, which means we can inspect the initial values of the two vectors before we performed our vector addition. So what were those variable names? We had vec1 and vec2. So let's inspect the current data stored inside of there. Let's do x slash eight decimal words since we stored eight values inside of our vector. And let's do our vector and vec1. Here we go, we have our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we should see something similar for vec2 as well. And there we go. So these are the two vectors that we're going to be performing addition on using this vAdd vector vector instruction. If we checked the values stored inside of our result memory location right now, it would probably just be kind of junk data because we haven't actually performed the addition yet and stored that addition inside of that memory address. So let's let our program run so we can get past that portion and then check the addition or the sum of these two vectors. I'm going to do C for continue. And now we've hit our second breakpoint towards the end of the program. Now we've effectively performed our addition, so we can inspect the memory location inside of our result variable. Let's just reuse our name and we'll do result. And then sure enough, two, four, six, eight, so on. That is the sum of these two vector values. So we have successfully performed our operations. If you'd like to look at a real world implementation of the RISC-V vector instructions, you can actually take a look at the FFmpeg source code. Now this particular commit contains a ton of inline assembly that's performing a lot of different operations on a few different vectors. Let's scroll down and take a quick look at what the code looks like. Let's go. Here we have our inline assembly that is getting added down here. Now let's look for our vector specific operations. We should recognize this v set vli setting the type and length for the vectors looks really similar to the same instruction that we were using previously. Let's see where our vector instructions are. We have a couple vector multiplication that's actually multiplying a vector and a scalar value together and storing the result inside of our v8 vector register. Moving on, we have a lot of different vector specific operations that are multiplying different vector and scalar values together and performing a little bit of vector addition. And all of this is placed inside of a loop. Here we have our loop up here. 
These kinds of optimizations are really important for encoding frameworks since they require a lot of high performance for their operations. For example, if we were taking a look at our code and we wanted to add these two vectors together and we wanted to do it one at a time, that would repeat these instructions over and over again for every single value inside of these vectors one by one. But we can optimize this process so much more by using vector operations, which makes our code so much more optimized and so much more efficient. All right, before you go out and buy one of these, let's talk about how tough this is. As cool as RISC-V is, we're still in the very early stages and software support is rough. It's going to get better with time, but I wouldn't throw out your Raspberry Pi in the closet just yet. The number of pre-compiled packages is weak, to put it lightly, and even then, few are taking advantage of the vector instructions. Needless to say, things can get pretty slow if you aren't compiling your own packages. Peripheral support is weird, and I couldn't get HDMI or Wi-Fi to work, and the Ethernet nick is funky with a randomly changing MAC address that I can't seem to get rid of. But I guess I just can't get over the fact of how exciting this time in history is. Just think, you're watching an instruction set being developed before your very eyes, and not just any instruction set, an open source one. If you're clever enough, yes, even you could propose a new CPU instruction. Join a special interest group, pass the community review, and get stakeholder consensus. Boom. Your instruction is now part of the ISA. How cool is that? Admittedly, it might be a little bit ambitious, but nevertheless possible. And there are certainly other ways you can get involved. Get one of these guys to play around with some assembly. Don't just let the compiler do everything for you. I'm a big believer in understanding the assembly instructions themselves. And this is a rare time in history where you can watch an instruction set being created before your eyes. Join some mailing lists, hang out in the working groups, and spread the word. It might just be the future of computing. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like the style of content, don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, glory wired out. I literally... Oh my God. I'm gonna blame, blame the controller, not the person holding the controller. Oh, shoot!